This is part two of the conversation with Travis Fritz and John Haggerty. So now, right now, uh, this is where, um, you know, it is not a, a momentous occasion for you, but for me, it absolutely was. No, it was a, no, it's a big deal. So, uh, so I'm working at Min Brew, uh, brewmaster there. Well, the guy that hired me, his name uh, is Sig Plagans, and Sig, Sig's still around. Sig was a German dude, uh, and still you know, had this accent like he was like right off the boat, man. I mean, you wouldn't have known that he had been working in the brewery there in St. Paul for who knows how 20 years or something, 30 years. Um, And that was a really interesting crew of guys, right? Because those guys, uh, that was a union brewery. It was big. The the brew house was like 800 barrels. I mean, it was massive, right? And uh, those guys were all union guys. And so I was in the union there, which was great. Uh, the machinist union? I think I it remember. It was the uh, Aerospace Engineers Union, right? Yeah, it was the same, it was the same there union. Had been, uh, there had been a, like a brewer's union up in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area because there had been, you know, lots of breweries, you know, Hams and Blatts and Strohs and, you know, Min Brew, which had been a, a Schmidt brewery originally, uh, Grain Belt had their own brewery. I mean, there were, there's all, you know, so there had been a, a pool of labor that had been there that had unionized, and but that was all gone, right? I mean, at the right. time, you had the craft brewers that were there, and you had Min Brew, and that was it. Uh, Stroh's closed their last plant up there in like 97 or 98, because oh, I was still at the club so when I was, I was there, and I had a handful of guys from Stroh's try to come in and apply for jobs, and I was like, one man show, man. Uh, anyway, so I was there and it was great. Phil Gagne, uh, well, Zig retired. I was like the last guy that Zig hired. Uh, really interesting guy. And then Phil Gagne became the brewmaster. And then uh, George Brown and Tom Clark were the assistant brewmasters. And uh, I talked to Phil still periodically. Uh, I talked to Tom a lot. Tom and I got to be really good friends. And uh, you know, I just talked to Tom a couple of days ago, you know, also a great mentor for me because Tom, uh, Tom's father was a artist. He liked to weld. And so he basically grew up in a junkyard, right? Cause his dad awesome. would collect anything that was metal and throw it in the backyard and then go weld these sculptures and stuff together. And so Tom learned how to like fix all these machines and over time, uh, my relationship with Tom, Tom taught me how to do a lot of maintenance work on machines and how to think about machines. And it was a really invaluable experience for me because now I'm able to do stuff. Because, you know, we were talking about growing up, you know, my grandfather had been a roofer, right? And so they weren't super wealthy. My dad wasn't super wealthy. And so they had to fix all their stuff themselves. But then my dad, uh, you know, my dad worked for a bank and my dad hated doing that stuff. And he made enough money, he didn't have to change his own oil, right? So consequently, he didn't teach me how to do any of it. Right. 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 What he was trying to teach me was make enough money so you don't have to do it. Right. Pretty common from that generation to the next. Yeah. And so I, I didn't know how to do that stuff. And so when I met Tom, Tom really was the one that, that taught me how to do all that kind of thing. And so another really great mentor for me, and by the way, Tom uh, owns a little brewery over in Berwick, Pennsylvania now, which is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and it makes great beer and uh, great pizza. I think he's trying to sell it. So if anybody's looking to buy a little brewery in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, there's one for sale in Berwick. Sounds good to me. Yeah, uh, really, really great dude. Um, but uh, I digress. Uh, so I worked for those guys. I worked in the union. The union was was interesting uh, because those guys, you know, they had different nomenclature for stuff. And like all these guys had been there since they got home from the Vietnam War, right? So right. they'd been there for the better part of 30 years when I showed up. Jesus. Right. And some of those guys, you know, they some of them would tell you some stories about, you know, like uh, this guy, Tom uh, Blaha. I think his last name was Tom got trapped behind the Viet Cong lines for two weeks by himself. Jesus. You know, just running around in the jungle, trying to make it back. And, and he did. And, uh, I never saw the guy sit down ever. Like huh. you'd be in the lunchroom and the guy just pace. Just, you know, some of these guys were, I mean, 
you know, and they all, they, they graduated from high school, went to the war, came back, got a job in the plant in the neighborhood that the plant was in because it was all residential around them. They all lived there, you know, walked to work. And, you know, you'd hear these stories about like back in the day, because, you know, previous to about 76 or 77, breweries didn't think that they had any liability for giving their staff alcohol while they were at work, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. I can't remember what year that was exactly, but it was Coors, right? They got sued because one of their employees killed someone driving home just out of their mind, wasted. Because these old plants, they used to have taps in like every room. Yes, and yes. All day, right, and these guys would just drink through their whole shift. In fact, and these guys are telling me stories like, yeah, people used to come to work two or three hours early. Yes. So they could sit here and drink before they started working. And then they would get off work and they'd go hang out in the break room and their wives would have to walk over from the neighborhood in order to pull them out of the break room to get them to come home for dinner and see their kids. Jeez. Right. And then like the cops, you know, the cops knew there were free beer. So the cops would come by when they would get off shift and sit in the break room with the brewers and have beers for free. Right. right? right. And so the cops and the brewers were all buddies. And so if you were on your way home or if you were in an inebriated state and you got yourself in some trouble, the cops would show up, they'd see you and they just pull you out, put you in the squad car, drive you home, drop yep. you off the problem. Right. Yep. I mean, that's the way the world used to work. It is the way the world used right? to work. I mean, then that's all, all gone. So being able to sit there with these guys and hear these stories, right, mm -hmm. about how it used to be like the guy, there was a guy, you know, was, he was gone before I got there. But uh, I was running what we called the industrial filter, right, which is a DE filter. Of course. They called it the industrial filter. And so there was this spot that you would always stand in while you were running it because the sight glass is right there. So you could see the quality of the filtration as it passed by, right? And by the way, it's running 300 barrels an hour. Jesus. Right? Which, you know, when I, I came over from the brew pub, I think the last year I worked at the brew pub, we did 350 barrels of beer for the whole year. Right? And now I'm running this filter. We're doing 300 barrels in an hour. Right? Jeez and, Louise. And... Well, I'll tell you about the filter in a second, but where you stood to do that, there happened to be a little spot floor drain right there. Oh, well, we know right. what that's and so I'm, I'm talking to the guys and they're like, yeah, yeah, so-and-so ran this machine for like 25 years. And he would stand here and pull samples off the Zwickle and drink them. Sure. Right, the, Z the Zwickle's the sample cock. Then you just sit there and drink all day. And he would never go to the bathroom because he just pee down his leg of his pants into the floor drain. Uh, that is not exactly what I was expecting that story to resolve into. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, what the deuce, right? I mean, and it was just, it was just endless, endless stories like that. Like, uh, yeah. we had up in A cellar. So there was, there was A through F cellar was fermentation. So it was like six stories tall, right? Jeez. And A cellar was all these recti uh, rectilinear open top fermenters. And yep. there was a, there's an aisle down the middle, and then there was square rectangle tanks on each side, all the way down with swimmers in them and whatever. And so you would, when you fill one tank, they were all 400 barrels. So you'd have to fill across the aisle, you know, tank, tank, you know, A on the one side and B on the other side, whatever. Because to get the yeast out from the back of the tank after the tank was empty, had to have this long handled sort of squeegee thing yep. to pull the yeast up to the drain point because the bottom was flat, right? Yep. Well, the handle was so long, you had to stick it in the manway of the tank across the way. Or okay. you got you it. Get all the way to the back of the tank. This is what right? you were talking about at the beginning of the conversation, right? Just the organizing right. your space. Right. So, uh, Anyways, one day uh, I'm working there and uh, they had hired a, a new guy. I can't remember the guy's name. We'll call him Bob. Okay, Bob. So they're like, hey, take Bob up to A cellar and uh, teach him how to clean the open top tanks. I'm like, yeah, okay, come on. So we go up there and I hook all the hoses up and whatever. And open the drain on the tank and sort of walk him through. This is what you got to do. It's like, you know, if you have any problems, just give me a yell. I'm going to go across the work aisle and I'm going to start working on the other tank. All right. So if anything seems out of out of whack, just give me a yell, I'll come over. So, you know, a few minutes go by and he's like, hey, is there supposed to be water building up in this tank? And I'm like, you're in it, buddy. Yeah. I'm like, no, no, there's <laughs> no. I said, just stop and let me come over. 
I come and I look over the side of the tank, and sure enough, there's about half a foot of water in the bottom of this tank. Huh. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So uh, I, you know, I'm like, well, let me make sure I hooked up the hoses right. And so I climb down and I look at the I look at the drain. It's like, yep, the hose is coming off the tank drain. It's over to the spot drain on the floor, which was a pipe. You know, it, you'd attach it to a pipe. We didn't just let it run onto the floor. So I couldn't tell if any liquid was coming out or not. My supposition is there's not. Right. Building up in tank. So uh, I close the valve and I disconnect a hose from the tank and, you know, open the valve back up to see if any water, could, nothing comes out. Like, all right. So I like lean over and I look in the valve and I can see there's something in there. It looks like, like a, a sort of a black plastic garbage bag, like a glad garbage bag, right? It's sort of that color of black green. I'm like, what the heck is that? So I stick my hand in there and pull this out. And then this, this, you know, this valve is like four or five inches in diameter. So this, this giant stream of water comes. So I shut the valve and I turn and I look and I'm holding the wing of a dead bat. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So the bat had like come in because it's open top fermenter, right? This whole cellar. So they have to ventilate the cellar or it'd kill you when you walked in there, right? Of course. And so somehow it'd come in through the ventilation system, got overcome by the CO2 and psh, nosedived into the tank. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, uh, take the bat and I get on the elevator and I go downstairs to the office and I'm like, Hey, yo, Phil, there was a bat in, you know, in a cellar up in this tank. I said, maybe you want to run some extra tests on that. <laughs> that bat. He looks at me and goes, ah, we got a pasteurizer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We ain't killing anybody bottling. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, and that's the kind of crap that went on there. I mean, it was, just, it was constant. Like, they called the Whirlpool uh, the swirl tank. The right? swirl tank. Swirl tank. And, um, you know, there was all these, there's a union shop, so you were assigned to a job, right? So, like, I, I ran the industrial filter for a while. I was second shift kettle for a while. But there was a job, you know, and, and, and depending on how long you'd been there, you know, you had seniority and you'd get preferential uh, treatment for for whatever job you wanted or, or preference. So there was a job called the Cooler Man. Cooler Man. You that sounds cool. Man? Yeah, you know what the Cooler Man did? No. He ran the heat exchanger. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yes, that was his job. He ran the heat exchanger. To run it, not and and I suppose additional responsibilities to clean it. That's not. Well, yeah, but. but you know, it was interesting because you go through the through the swirl tank, and then once the swirl tank was done, you would pump it up to the pan, and the pan was basically a big rectangular buffer tank. Okay. Right, and so the cooler guy would receive the, the wort coming up to the pan, and then at a certain once the pan got a certain amount full, then he'd start to run it through the heat exchanger. You know, and he had to watch the temperature, or whatever, and, and make sure that he was then also hooked up to the right tank going into the right tank and whatever cellar we were going to and he also had the responsibility of pitching the yeast but over the course of of a brew day the guy had eight hours on the clock the guy probably did an hour and a half worth of work yeah maybe and the rest of the time he's in the break room drinking coffee, right? drinking I mean, coffee. It, it was just the most crazy thing you know multiple times having my you know, people threatening to kick my ass because I was working too hard. And, you know, all the, the union stuff. Union, yeah, yeah, all the typical union stuff. But, I mean, it really great experience and, and fun and good stories and whatever. So, anyway, so I'm there. And, uh, you know, it's like, okay, I need, uh, I need to go to brewing school. Because what was starting to happen, uh, this is around 2000. You know, I'd go in for job interviews for places. And I'd get all the way to the end because I had, I had, you know, seven or eight years of experience at the time for multiple breweries. And, uh, you know, I'd make it to the end, right? I'd be down to the last two or three candidates, but somebody would have a brewing degree. They, they might not have any experience, but they'd have a brewing degree. Yep. And, you know, the HR person or whoever is in charge of hiring, you know, the plant manager would be put in this position. Do I hire the experience or do I hire the degree? Well, 
If I hire the experience and the guy doesn't work out, that reflects poorly on me. But if I hire the degree and the guy doesn't work out, I can say, well, you had a degree. How was yep. I supposed to know? Right. Yep. And so I would get all the way there and then I would lose out. So I'm like, okay, writing's on the wall. I got to go formalize this. I need to get my, my brewing degree. And I did, I did a lot of looking around and you'll recall at the time, I think like to go to Siebel, which was in Chicago was about 18 grand. Yep. Uh, the, the, program out at uh uh the in the uh uc davis uc davis but it was it wasn't the four-year program at davis it was the other program they ran through the extension college i can't right. remember but that was about 18 grand yep. brewer's guild was 18 grand at it well hey look vlb six grand six grand and and i get to go live in germany for a year yeah. so it's going to cost me like the same amount of money yep and you know, I get to go live in Germany. So I was like, oh, I'm I'm all about this. Now, I think part of that was because, as you recall, I mean, the VLB had gone from being sort of publicly supported and teaching everything in German and in free right. for local students to like, hey, we're going to we're going to strike out on our own and we're going to start to try to attract a more international student body. And I don't think they really understood the value of what they were offering no now i've had guys that have worked for me here in ohio go to that program and now the program is more commensurate in terms of cost with uh, what with it should be group here in the u.s yeah right yeah right we got it steal man that no was absolutely and i mean it was a i mean look i i went into this uh to the vlb with zero experience none yeah. Right. I was an aimless 21 year old and I had to make a decision and I spoke German. Right. Yep. Um, Which, by the way, was a huge help to me. Good. <laughs> well, uh, I think one hand washed the other in a lot of different ways there uh, on that. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I I had no idea. Uh, I could imagine, I guess, but I had no real idea uh, what I was I was getting into. And I think that you did. Um, and uh, and for me. Um, that, uh, that, that, uh, interpretation from what, uh, we were being taught at the VLB to, uh, more real world kind of practical application was invaluable. Um, yeah. I didn't even know what a brew house looked like, yeah. um, or what the individual pieces did. And conceptually, I still, this, I still have a sensitivity to this, right. Um, when I'm trying to explain things, um, you know, man, I would sit uh, the, that first semester in class and just be, I'm still trying to figure out what exactly a water ton or a match filter, had, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so the, the, the scientific con concepts that we were learning weren't beyond me. I mean, that, that's something I had studied before, but um, the practical concepts were completely out of my, my ken, totally. Yeah. Well, there's uh, a vernacular in the brewery, right? That, that gets used. And if you don't know what those words mean, then how on earth are you going to know what people are talking about? Right, right. And I mean, I could, I could, right. I, the German is a practical language. So a lot of times, you know, for example, a pencil is called a lead stick. Still, Bleistift is what a pencil is called. It's a completely literal language. Everybody knows that about German, except for when it comes to brewing terms. And they're all these super archaic, completely untranslatable terms, right? So it's frustrating. Yep. But, um, but I, as I say, a, a great education by the time I got done with it, there was a lot I was ready to do, um, but I certainly wasn't ready to do the things that I ended up doing, and so relied on you a lot, um, and 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 other uh, you know, kind of second wave brewers uh, here in Michigan um, to teach me, including Dan Rogers and a lot of guys. Yeah, Dan's great, yeah, yep. Um, so in in Berlin, right? We we land in Berlin. Uh, well, I in, want to back up for a yeah. second too, just to give people some sense of timing on how this works right because okay we went over in october of 2001 and what september, happened in september I was, 2001 yeah i i went so my flight was scheduled on september 13th yeah uh, uh, of 2001 to go yeah because i had stephanie at the time going coming yeah, with right. me you know we had to set up something before school started um and we went over there with no, no plan no plan, right? I was going to go to the whatever umpt they had to to find an apartment and register ourselves and all that kind of stuff. But Stephanie didn't speak German either, right? 
Um, so we needed that extra time. I really wanted that extra time. And uh, as it turns out, there was a week when nobody was flying anywhere. And that was right, right. after September 11th, as you say. Yeah. So yeah. it was interesting. I, I didn't, you know, like you said, we've got all this set up. You, you've got your plans in place and you think, oh, this is going to happen. Right. I had my plans in place and I think this is going to happen. And then 9-11 happens. And so it's like, oh, what's going to happen now? Right. And so I think we were all sort of confronted with this, like, do I still go or do I back out? Yep. Right. And clearly you and I and Stephanie uh, decided that we were still up for it and we yep. went. But yep. my recollection was that there was a handful, maybe a few, maybe three, maybe five. I don't I don't know other Americans that were supposed to have been there in our course. Yep. They didn't show up. So consequently, you and I were the only you know, folks from the United States that were there. Yep. Uh, which made it interesting. And I think, uh, you know, we may have become friends anyways, but yeah. due to that fact, I think we became a lot closer. Like, uh, yeah, it's like, I mean, right? absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I would say if I were you at that time, um, I probably would not have gotten as close to, uh, you know, 21, 22 year old dude who had no fucking idea what he was doing. Yeah, um, you got to keep in mind that most of the guys in that course were 21 or 22 years old with no fucking idea. What <laughs> so, I, there, was, there was that group of Japanese guys. Those guys yep. were those guys were on. Yoshi. But they were Japanese, you know, and so yep. it was it was hard to relate to them. It was. Uh, I mean, they were great. Koji was awesome. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I've tried to find him a couple times, uh, in nothing. I, I, you know, who knows? They had such particular tastes and schedules is what I remember. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it was, I listened to jazz with a cigar and a glass of bourbon. Yeah. That's At what this, I do. From this time to this time. Exactly. Right. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. Let's go out and get wasted, bro. We're in Berlin. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's the you belongs, brother? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and then, was, then you have the, the the folks that were foreign but European. We had a student from the Faroe yeah. Islands, right? Uh, Annika, yeah, Faroe, Annika, yeah. A uh, bunch of guys from South America. Uh, in fact, I just talked to Bruno via WhatsApp a couple days Bruno's ago. Daddy. I was like, hey, dude, you still drinking Fernet Branca? And I get this picture back with him holding a bottle of Fernet Branca because he and I used to go to this bar called the Astro Bar. Oh, and yeah. drink Fernie Branca and Coke and play chess. Yeah. Do you know, when was the last time you had a, I used to drink it with him too at uh, Klein Sachs. Uh, yeah, Klein Sachs. You and I hung out with all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, when was the last time you had Fernie and Coke? Probably when I left Berlin. <laughs> it's, See, not my it's not drink. good. No. No. <laughs> I've had it since then. And I remember oh. loving it when we were there, man. And it's, ugh. yeah, it's, it's, yeah, uh, that's, that's like, you know, Bruno's favorite drink, but you know, Bruno's yeah. exceptional. So yeah. he's an eccentric dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, the last time I saw him, I think, I think was at CBC in San Diego in probably 2008, but I've talked to him since then. Yeah. I think I saw he's, him. Uh, yeah. He's leaving, he's living his best life down there in Argentina. Yeah, he is. He's got a little brewery down in, down there in, uh, called Berlina in, in Argentina. Great dude. Yeah. So, so this is what we, this is what we, have you heard from? Well, anyway, this is a conversation for another time when we're not trying to tell Maybe. people what brewing is like. Maybe. Um, but, you know, we had like Hiroko Takahara, who had her own really interesting yeah. story. And I mean, golly, there were you know, there's a lot of people. Yeah, it um, was great. Yeah. Uh, but, Vilko, but I think. Holger. Vilko, Holger Lampe. Holger. And, you know, these guys were awesome. Really good. Yeah, Vil Vilko actually came out here and spent a couple weeks with us in I think 2012. My kids were oh little. right on. Um, yeah, and he is a he is a boat captain in Scotland. The last time I heard that was about a year year and a half ago. Oh really? He's not brewing anymore. Nope. I mean, he may have yeah. something to do with uh, Holberg. Yeah. Uh, was his brewery in in Berlin? Yeah. I, I don't know, but yeah, he's a he's a boat captain. Sweet, good for him. Yeah, he's a cool dude. Anyway. Eccentric people like brewers are misfits to one degree or another. Yeah. Um, so I fit uh, right in, I think. Um, yeah, I think, I think we all do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, uh, you know, the experience in Berlin was was super interesting. But for me, uh, remains in my memory just this kind of 
overwhelming sort of pastiche of of moments more than anything I could put a particular narrative to. Yeah, um, uh, I, I I think my experience is a little bit different uh, because from the from the brewing school perspective, you know, it was right in my wheelhouse. I mean, I'd already been doing it for the better part of a decade when I showed up there. But the cultural part was harder for me than I think it was for you because I couldn't speak German really. Uh, right. And not even, I couldn't speak German, period. Uh, I didn't know two words when I landed and I had to learn it all on the fly in order to get around, just buy groceries and get myself fed. And I, I mean, ended up having a, a shaved head for most because I couldn't tell the barber how to cut my hair, right? <laughs> So, uh, uh, you know, that was interesting. And I remember there was this little Asian restaurant sort of around the corner from the apartment building I lived in. And, uh, you know, I'd always have to go and point at the menu to order because I couldn't I couldn't say numbers. I couldn't speak the words. And um, one day I remember it went in and I, I knew how to say numbers. Right. Yeah, I remember and when you learned how to say numbers. I ordered something and the guy looked at me like, Holy shit! <laughs> Learning how to speak German. I'm like, Yay! <laughs> but I went there a lot because it was funny. You know, those guys obviously are not German; they were Asian people, right. and so uh, whatever their status was, why were why they were there, I don't know. But uh, they were a lot more tolerant of me, yes, uh, and my inability to speak German and and understand what was going on because they were in the same boat, right? Yep. Yeah, well, and it was there a lot. I, I remember having conversations with um, German, the German students, and 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 German folks that that knew both of us um, a lot. And and I think, uh, and and you would come up, and I think what was frustrating was, and I don't know if this is a German thing or just a human thing or what, but um, I think what was frustrating for them was you look like everybody else there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for them. I, you know, things had to kind of line up. So if there was a, you know, maybe an Asian person that worked at an Asian restaurant and they didn't speak German well, that's understandable, right? They clearly are not German. Um, I lived across the street from the Sierra Leone club and I used to hang around there a lot and have a Guinness extra uh, with those dudes from Sierra Leone who spoke English. Um, but likewise, Germans didn't really, I mean, they made, anyway. They, they probably they, wouldn't they, they yeah. they understood, but with you it was like I, I, this guy should be speaking German, right? What yeah. what is wrong? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it wasn't something that like, was... shit. That's what was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, it's German is a is, is is its own. Yeah, you know. Well, you know, by the end of our time there, I I could speak enough. I remember this guy, like random guy on the street. I'm walking down the street, pulled his car over, and asked me for directions on how to get to the highway. And I understood what he asked me and I was able to give him an answer. Right. There you go. Right. And so, you know, I was learning it. Uh, but then I left and I came home and, of course. Psh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I, I still talk to folks in Germany a lot in German just to keep it sharp. I try and watch movies in German to keep it sharp. It's a skill that I have so few. I don't want to lose that one. No, that's a, and it's a great skill. You should put effort into that. And, <laughs> you know, I think. If I remember, like your grandmother was German or something, right? And My great grandmother was, yeah. She spoke yeah. A, a kind of German called Plattdeutsch, which is a lot more like Dutch than German. Yeah, yeah. But so that gave you that foundation, right? Yep. And, you know, I, you know, my my uh, great grandparents were were German uh, as well, as it turns out, on my mother's side, and my grandmother spoke German. But then World War II happened. Yep. And at World War II, you know, it was bad to be German. And so as a German speaker, she and my grandfather were just like, we're not speaking German and we're not teaching it to our kids. And so that part of their culture was lost around World War II. Yeah. And so it's gone. It's out of our family, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I there was something I had, you know, I, I had a, a, a knack for. And like I said, man, I was, uh, I was just ambitious enough to know that if something was easy for me, I should probably try at it because I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a lot of those chances. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we go, and I don't mean to gloss over it, but I mean, you know, school is, is, is school. Well, I'd be, I, I got to say one more thing. Yeah. Because right? I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Wackerbauer because I okay. love that dude. That dude was the man. 
<laughs> Not right. just Wackerbauer then. Yeah, yeah. Wackerbauer <laughs> was he's he, amazing. Yeah, he was king, man. I love that guy. Rest Yoda. Uh, yeah, he was. He was the beer Yoda. Mm -hmm. And I and I also uh, need to bring up a friend and colleague, Oliver Wesselo, who okay. I still keep in regular contact with. He's got his own little brewery in Hamburg now. Uh, and, you know, Oliver was a great friend to me. He was he was one of the few Germans. There was a few. There weren't a lot. Uh, Holger and Wilco definitely were uh, accommodating. Yes. And Oliver, uh, for sure, uh, because a lot of the other German people weren't. No. Right. Yeah. And Oliver really went out of his way uh, to make me feel welcome in Germany. And it was great. Yeah. yeah. Well, and remembering too, this is, you know, this is Berlin, man. This is a big, big city. Yeah. Yes. Um, so for example, my experience as a teenager, uh, oh, you froze up. I had a scholarship and major and Munich and Bavaria are much more rural. They're not as fast paced. It's not as real. It is now, but at the time it wasn't a real sort of hard city vibe. Um, and people were real, but again, I spoke German, but, but people were really accommodating then. Um, and Berlin, to me, being able to speak the language fluently just felt like New York, right? Yeah. And yeah. nobody had time for anybody. Nobody was paying. Well, yes, yeah. I, I agree. That, that, that was part of it. That's yeah. definitely part of it. Yeah. But there is a German, there is a kind of a fuck you German attitude as well. Yeah. Um, for sure. Uh, but Wackerbauer. I, I, that wasn't the reason I brought it up. I brought that up because I owe those guys a thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. As do I. Um, I wasn't as close to Oliver, uh, certainly, but, but Vilko and Holger, I, I, I was, um, it's a lot, I mean, there are a lot of stories and all that kind of stuff that are interesting. Uh, but I think it is good to focus on, uh, Wackerbauer because he bridges generations and was alive during the second world war. Right. I mean, he used to tell us, you know, he, he ran our theory lectures, right. And, and yep. we'd be in, in a Berlin theory lecture and he'd just break out some story about like, hey, this is what it was like during the Berlin airlift. Floor malting in short pants or whatever. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was just crazy that the stuff, I mean, if you were paying attention, the stuff that he would drop, you know, and just like, oh my God, that guy saw that, you know, yeah. live that. It know? was incredible. Yeah. Uh, it was incredible to know and, and, and well-respected, but also, you know, a conflicted guy about his own legacy, which was interesting for me at that age to, I mean, he talked yeah. to me about it. Um, yes. to, 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 you know, Kunze, um, all this kind of stuff that he had worked so hard to generate, uh, you know, the VLB and, and what it was and, you know, created this legacy for himself, but was uh, overshadowed at times by, by, by his peers in a way that, that seemed to frustrate him. And it was interesting to see uh, that for me too. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's all true. And he did a couple things that I think if he could have undone, he, he would have, and it's sort of tarnished his legacy at the VLB, unfortunately. Um, I'm not going to really go into that stuff, but yeah, I think we, but, think we've but, uh, for me, he was great. Yeah, me too. I wouldn't too. have picked anybody else to be my my brewery professor. He was. Awesome. I have been golfing in Arizona, and yeah. one must drink four liters of water for one small piss. One small piss. That's right. <laughs> Just, like, dude, where'd that come from? Yeah, right. that was out of nowhere. By the way, there was no context to that. He right. was saying, "Oh, you're from America. Here's my American story." Well. Yeah. And he was like, how many people in here have been to the United States? And so you made everybody raise their hand. And of course, you and I were the only ones with our hands up. And then he says that. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, OK, dude, but yes, you're right. But it's a big country, everybody. But yeah, that's true, I imagine. Um, yeah. So uh, now and, and we're running long, man. You still got time? No, I, I got time. Yeah. All right. So uh, we somehow. Uh, well, you did quite well. I think you graduated just behind Holger Lampa, who, if I remember, had the best score uh, in like 30 years at the VLB. Well, uh, he might have, but he didn't graduate from the same program that we graduated. Of course. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So but, I graduated at the top of our course. I'm sure yeah. Holger graduated at the top of his. Whatever yeah. It was. yeah. And I guess I guess I meant to say that more um, to point out less to point out the differentiation between the courses and more to point out the kind of richness of talent that was there um, oh, yeah. that that I got to learn from, uh, you know, certainly. Well, you know, like those Japanese guys. I mean, there was a guy from Korean, Sapporo yep. and Asahi. Yep. Right. 
-hmm. the year before we were there, uh, Augie Four went through that yeah. course. Yeah. Uh, Scott Jennings, who runs the Sierra plant in North Carolina, went through that course. Yep. Um, so there was there was a lot of people. Annika from the Far Island, her fair, her family owned a brewery. Um, yeah. So there was there was a lot there. It was, yeah. it was really uh, you know really culturally diverse group of people in that classroom. Yeah, not forgetting Kamol Tuvachit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kamol from Thailand. Yeah, yeah. Kamol was great. Yeah, Kamol was great, but he was a little nutty. He well, weren't we all a little? But he was particularly, particularly, yeah. um, yeah, and and a washout rate that was pretty intense. Honestly, in that program, I mean, I think we lost several students by the end of that. That I may have stuck around like um, like Bruno did, but didn't uh, end up graduating. I know one of the one, yeah. at least one of the Japanese students didn't didn't end up graduating, and um, I, I feel like there was a fair amount of that by the end of the by the end of the program. Yeah, it's different. Uh... It was certainly a different experience going through that program than going through an American school. Right. <laughs> Regardless of topic. Right. Right. Because in the American schools, you know, it's like, oh, look, we have to maintain a graduation rate because people pay us to come here. And it was right. run like a business. Yep. So they're sort of motivated to not fail you out. Right. right. So even even if you really don't show up and don't do your work, you get a C. Right. 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 Uh, but over there, they were like, listen, if you don't do the work and you don't show up, you don't get a diploma. Yeah. Right. Thank you for your money. Right. Right. It happened. That happened to a few people. Um, Joel, I think that happened. Yeah. And I felt, I felt terrible because I was like, how do you, I mean, he was a kid, uh, you know, he's 21 years old or something. And yeah, so was, I, think I think he was a couple of years older than I was. Yeah. I mean, I, I can, I get it. You know, for some people, you know, being, you know, that young and, and you're living in Germany and it's like beer everywhere and it's hard to keep yourself on the straight and narrow. Right. And so easy to kind of screw yourself up. And, and he did. And I, I would always think, man, you know, how is he going to go home and explain that to his family? Right. That I, I, I don't know. Right. And they used to intentionally do stuff. I mean, if you remember like, hey, you know, tomorrow are final exams. But by the way, we're having a party tonight at the yep. island plant and you're expected to be there and you got to hang out and have yeah. a beer or two. So the, the trick and it was almost like they did it intentionally they did. to see if you had control of yourself enough to be in this industry. Yep. Right? Yep. Like you show up where there's free beer, have a beer to socialize and then get home, study for the test and show up tomorrow prepared and ready to go. Right. Let me let me add a layer to that. I remember one of those parties um, and I remember uh, Dr. Wackerbauer uh, being there, which was an occasion. Right. The way yeah. that the way that uh, the Germans particularly showed respect and deference to him was something that yeah. I really never experienced when there's not that kind of formal culture, um, at least in the class that I was born into in the United States. Yeah. Um, but uh, I remember very clearly. Uh, because there was a little Wackerbauerism uh, associated with it. Um, sitting at a table, it was in that that pilot brewery, um, and they had a little raised area where there was a table. And Dr. Wackerbauer invited me over to the table uh, to speak German with the the unusually, you know, able to speak German American. I think it was yeah. just interesting to him. Yeah. And uh, so I sat down with a beer, um, and he, you know, well, let's finish our beers and then we can start talking. And we have Half, half beer or whatever and uh finished and uh got another beer and started talking and carried on the conversation and i was trying to keep up with wackerbauer who by the way at that time i was a six foot two 225 230 pound ex-football player and wrestler who had drank plenty of beer right i was no problem and dr wackerbauer was what 70 something maybe older five, yeah, he was about five two maybe five two maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, probably, probably went about a buck 20. Yeah, um, that's probably fair. And I thought, no, okay. I mean, I'll keep up with him. This is a great opportunity to talk to him. So we talked and we had some beer and I remember thinking, okay, well, that's probably enough beer for me tonight. And at that moment, I remember him pulling out a bottle of vodka and putting oh, yeah. it on the table. I got one of those stories too. Yeah. And say, I, well, I don't know if he said this to you when I tried to demure, he said, 
what's wrong, Travis? You're not thirsty? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, he didn't say that to me, no. In English, right? Yeah. Uh, he switched over to English to, to be like, you know, hey, man, yeah. get, get, get a drink. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. There, there was a lot of that kind of setup happening there. And thank God, uh, by hook or crook, uh, it, was, it was able to be yeah. out Yeah, well, you know, fortunately for me, when he pulled that on me, it wasn't the night before a test. <laughs> uh, he, he invited me and a couple of other students in our class to come to this thing that was for the German students. Ah. And uh, not, the, not Holger and Wilco German students, but the German students in like the four-year program. Right, yeah. Right? And uh, they were awarding some scholarship from BASF, I think, to, to one of the kids. Right. Yep. And uh, so they have this dinner and whatever. And, you know, I'm sitting right in the front row because, you know, I'm an ass kisser and whatever. Yeah, you got to do it. And, uh, um, dinner's over and he gets up and he's addressing the crowd. And there's maybe 50 or 60 people there. And, uh, you know, he's going on for a few minutes and he looks over and he sees me and he, he realizes I have no concept of what he's talking about. Just none. So he stops mid mid speech and he looks right at me and he's like, oh, I'm just telling everybody, you know, we had this great dinner. We had ice vine, which is this boiled pork knuckle and it's really heavy. And so after dinner, we need to have a digestive and he pulls out from behind his back like a gallon of absolute vodka. Right. And he walks around a room and he pours the shot for everybody. Right. Everyone gets one. And then we do a little cheers and salute and whatever. So we drink it. And then I happen to be sitting at this table with Dr. Hart, who was our chemistry professor and full-on abuser of alcohol. On 100%. Basis, right? <laughs> and he'd get up with it. Dr. Hart in his hand with just constant DTs. Right? Yep. Good dude, but it's like, oh, dude, you, yeah. need, you need to check yourself in. Yeah, end stage. So, in one of Wackerbauer's favorite drinking buddies, right? Yes. So he's sitting at my table. Wackerbauer comes over with the remaining half gallon of vodka <laughs> and sits down at my table. So Dr. Hart, Wackerbauer, and myself, boom, one shot each. They're just going back and forth in German. And I'm just like, well, I'm going to try to hang on for this one. Boom, do the shot. A few minutes later, boom, 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 another one. So we do about four or five shots, right? Now I'm still standing because I just ate like five pounds of ice wine, right? right? But I'm starting to feel, it, right. and it's like, okay, yeah. I'm I'm good, yeah. And he's like, no, no, John, one more, and then that's enough. And I'm like, okay, one more. So we do one more. I'm done. Bachabauer and Hart sit there and drink the rest of the bottle. Hell yeah, they did. Just boom, gone, yeah. and then like he always did. Wackerbauer called his like 60 year old son to come pick his ass up and drive him home, right? And his son shows up and just pissed, right? Just, <laughs> Dad, why do you always do this to me, right? It was ridiculous. He's Dr. Doc you, your father is Dr. Wackerbauer. This is yeah. an honor for you. Yeah, you should be honored to pick your drunken ass father up and drive him. <laughs> Who has no business being that drunk on like a fucking Wednesday. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah. uh, so so the VLB is the VLB, and yeah. uh, and we come back uh, to the United States. We both do. Um, yeah. I, I yeah. spent uh, a little bit longer uh, in Germany. You came back for a job that you had already gotten. Uh, no, sort of. Uh, I had a couple of interviews set up. So about a month or two before we graduated, I started sending out resumes and stuff yeah. to sort of prime the pump. Uh, and I had one in New York City. I didn't have anything concrete yet, but when I came back, I had a interview in New York City. Uh, so I went to that, decided I didn't like that. Uh, my brother was living there at the time, so I stayed with him while I was there and then flew back to my parents. My parents, uh, had moved from Indiana to Michigan, you know, while I was doing all the stuff that we've been talking about for the last hour or so. And so, uh, I stayed with them outside of Detroit and uh, at, at that point, I was like, you know, I've been so far away from my parents for so long and, you know, they're starting to get older. So, I mean, they weren't old at the time. They were probably about, you know, 
60 or so, but it's like, I want to get closer to them, right? I, I don't want to be on the other side of the continent anymore. Um, I want to be able to go see my parents periodically. So uh, this, I had actually applied for a job at this place in Grand Rapids called The Bob, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I am familiar. Uh, and this guy that was there, Dennis, uh, I can't remember Dennis's last name off the top of my head, but I knew Dennis from working out in Seattle. Okay. He had, he had run a, a brewery out there called Leavenworth, uh, which was like a town about an hour or so out of Seattle. So we used to cross paths when I was out there. So anyways, I, I sent a resume there and, and he emailed me back and he's like, look, we don't have anything, but I know these guys that are looking for someone to run their plant, which was New Holland. So he forwarded my resume to them. And they reached out to me and we set up an interview and I, and I went and, and took it. Uh, and I was interested in that job because it would have put me in, in Michigan. And it did put me in Michigan because I ended up get, getting it. Uh, but I remember sitting, uh, they used to have this, uh, the plant in the tap room was in this old uh, auto body shop right, on Fairbanks them. Avenue. I mean, it's a piece of shit, right? Mason jars. Yeah, and it was it was barely stand. That building was just falling apart. Yeah, but I remember going in there and having the interview uh, with Brett and Jason and uh, this guy Dave White, who is the general manager and runs all the retail ops. Uh, so Dave, uh, the three of us and, and myself, so we sat there and we were talking about what they were looking for and what I could do and their time and blah blah. And they were like, "Well, you know, you know we're gonna." You know, because they were building that new tap room that's downtown uh, Holland. It's still there, I think. Uh, they were getting ready to build that. And so we're getting the conversations winding up. And they're like, well, you know, we got to think about it for a couple of weeks. And, and I look at them and I'm like, I don't know what you're waiting for. Right. Like, if we if we look at this calendar, you want this thing to be open on this day. It's like, you're going to need to do this, 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 and this. You know, and we back it up. It's like, you should have hired somebody a month ago. Right. Right. So I'm here now. I'm interested in the job. <laughs> you going to hire me next day. They sent me an email and, you know, we worked out the details and I started, I think, at the end of that week. I mean, it was like, boom. And I, you know, I, I not this is not to say that, uh, you know, you uh, taking another job after New Holland was any more contentious than any other brewer moving on to a different job. But I, I'm sensitive to the idea that there may be some stuff that you, you can't talk about. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask. Because again, this is now 2000, late 2002, more or less. Yes, it was, it was uh, I started there in August of 2002. Okay. Uh, Where that first year, uh, at the end of 2002, I want to say we did something like 17 or 1800 barrels. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. 17 so, or 1800 barrels. And yeah. by the way, this was, um, this was a distributed and known brewery. Yeah, within Michigan, they were, they were five or six years old at that point. Yeah, you know? yeah. But there was there was stuff going on, you know, that was just not too professional standard, right? And that's not sure. to run anybody down. I'm not saying that to disparage anybody. It just it just wasn't right. Well, back I mean, there back no, then there was no forecasting of sales. No. There was no production planning. There was no, no. anything, and and so it led to a lot of bad decisions, right? Yep. Like, hey, we're going to rack this beer even though it's not ready. Yep. And, uh, it was interesting because I remember having a conversation early on. Uh, we used to make this wheat beer called Zoomer and the distributor showed up to pick up an order without any notice. I mean, they hadn't even submitted a PO. To the right. had no idea it was coming. All of a sudden, all these people are in my brewery and they're like, oh, we got to look. And it's like, well, here's what I have that's right that you can have. And we didn't happen to have any Zoomer. We happened to be out of it, but I had some in a tank and it was like nine days old. And, you know, one of the principals was like, hey, you know, rack that beer and let's keg it. And, and I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing that. It's not no, ready. Yeah. And he was pushing me to do it. And I was like, listen, here's how this is going to go. You can rack it and you can find a new brewer. Yep. Or you can get off my fucking dick. Yep. And yeah. Stay, right. That's yeah. it. The, 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 a, a mistake has been made here. Let's own it and move forward with quality right. beer. Right. Right. And so uh, there was a few months of that where it's like, you know, you had to really dig in and fight 
you know, cause it's a small company, they're fighting for every dollar. And it's like, look, I get it. I, I, my whole career has been built out of working in small companies for the most part. Yeah. But you know, the short term reward of that dollar is going to come back to haunt you six months down the road when people aren't buying your beer because they think it sucks. That's right. hundred percent. So, uh, you know, we really had to dig in. It's like, no, this is what we're going to do. And, in, you know, after about four or five months, you know, we, we sort of got stuff settled in. We still didn't have forecast. I basically was doing an internal forecast for the production company, looking at what our sales rates were, stuff going out the door. Sure. And then using that to project you know, what we needed to make. And, you know, we went from a fulfillment rate that was probably like 50 or 60% on the orders to where we were up over 95%. Right. And it's like, that's, that's how you run a production company. Well, that's right. certainly how you grow it. Right. Um, right. You, you, and so we grew that, uh, we grew that when I left, I left in 2012. And when I left, we were on pace to do about 25,000. You know, when I left, of course, that, you know, that, didn't I, I think it rocked the boat a little bit and I you know so maybe they ended up at like 22 or 23 mm -hmm. um but um you know that that was pretty good pretty good growth and i think they're they're maybe at 40 or 50 or something now i, I have no if, idea you, last time i talked to isaac i have an opportunity to do that occasionally because he calls me about guild stuff uh occasionally um, and he said, yeah, they were, they're up around 50,000 now. Yeah, so that's good. Good for them. And good for Isaac. I love Isaac. Isaac is great. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's a solid dude. Same yeah. dude, though. Yeah. Um, but uh, so New Holland happens. And I'm watching this, by the way, uh, because, you know, by the time you get all this production stuff sorted out, more or less, I'm back in the States um, yeah. and uh, hopping around in my first few jobs as a brewer. Yeah, you're over at Michigan Brewing. I was at Michigan Brewing for a little while working under Pierre Sellis, which was one of the most fantastic things that could possibly have happened to, yep, to anybody on my age. <laughs> Certainly yeah, anybody. Any age, frankly. Right. right. And, well, and Pierre, for sure. Um, but as a brewer, um, more than just Pierre, um, it was uh, Jean-Luc Seiss. Um, yeah. You know, Pierre was a, was a solid brewer, obviously. Um, but Pierre was more of a kind of a fearless, uh, ship captain more than, more than he was a brewer. Right. Yeah. Um, and John Luke was, uh, this Belgian guy, right. Pierre now, by the way, again, you know, five foot, nothing slight, always wore a bolo tie and cowboy boots. Cause he'd just yeah. come from Austin. Um, Jean Luke, uh, a tall, you know, aquiline nose gentleman, always wore a sport, sport coat and slacks to work. Um, and a very much uh, a traditional European, uh, really a traditional French or Belgian uh, brewer. Right. And was responsible, of course, for folks who don't brewing, know. Brewing manager. A brewing manager. Well, yeah. yeah. But I mean. It, it, don't be fooled. You're not wearing khaki pants and loafers out on the brew floor, right? Right. Well, I mean, He's by the way, it. he was also in his 70s at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, and, you know, the picture on the label was Jean-Luc and Pierre with their paddles over a wooden mash tun, which never happened for that brand. But, um, you know, I mean, he was the kind of guy who would do stuff that would impress somebody my age. Right. He would give me these things. Uh, so, you know, walk over to a fermenter and you know, sniff the, the, the blow off hose and tell you, okay, well, this beer is about that old and, you know, it'll have these problems. So now go do a, an analysis on it or whatever. Um, but, you know, P Pierre and Jean-Luc, who, who really did take me under their wing, uh, you know, toward the end of that time, essentially it told me, you know, you need to go back to Europe. You, this is crazy out here yeah. in the United States. Um, you don't, need this you should just go to go back to germany go to belgium i'll get you a job um you speak french you can work in france or belgium um and uh you know just don't do this this is insane right the way people run breweries over here um and i i couldn't and i didn't want to um and so we parted ways and, and of course uh you know lost touch eventually but um but anyway i'm watching you know you at new holland um and, uh, and other folks, you know, Bells at that time was still nascent compared to what they are now. Founders yeah. certainly was. Yeah. Um, and all that was happening somewhere on the west side of state in Grand Rapids. Um, but Atwater was kind of happening in Detroit and, and had this German model. Tom Majorosi was brewing over there at the time, I think. Um, and uh, so there were, there were a lot of interesting things happening, but Michigan hadn't by any means established itself 
um, within the craft beer community in the United States or anywhere else at that time. Yeah, but it was on its way. But it was on its way. Well, thanks to breweries like New Holland increasing some, you know, 1000 percent in terms of in terms of sales um, and, and a lot of the, the kind of, you know, Dragon's Milk is kind of an interesting footnote in um, in in and more than a footnote in Michigan. Well, before we get to that, I, I got to bring up one thing before we yeah. move away from your personal history, because I remember, you know, you invited me to come over for dinner one time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Dan Rogers was was a trained chef, right? So Dan, who was your direct supervisor, I think at the time, he was, you know, has us to his house for dinner and he makes like mashed potatoes and steaks and really, you know, simple, but awesome. Yes. And we go to the brewery and he lets me taste this Imperial Stout he'd made off the tank. Yeah. Right? And I look at Dan and I'm like, dude, this is good. I was yep. like, are you entering this beer into the GABF? He's like, oh, you think I should? I was like, yeah. I mean, he probably would have done it regardless. Yeah, maybe. But, but I was like, yeah, I think you should. And so then he had a sign-up sheet in the bar. I think I was like the second or third person to go ahead and sign up for a four-pack because I was so impressed with the beer, right? Yeah. And so I get a call however many months later, and I go get my four-pack, and whatever. And Dan enters the beer in the GABF, and I think he won a silver or bronze or something. He won something with yeah. that beer anyways. So I bring it all up, right? Because I still have one bottle of that beer sitting in my personal cellar, <laughs> right? And I'm like, cause I'm down to one, right? And I've been carrying it with me for like 15 years. Yeah, more, yeah. And yeah, maybe more, maybe it's like close to 20. Almost 20, yeah. Uh, and I keep waiting. It's like, I gotta, there's gotta be some occasion right. for me to open this. Yes. Right? Because I've had it for so long, right? I mean, I don't even know if it's any good anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that it is because it's it's a huge beer, right? But but I've been carrying it with me for so long. Uh, so well, and I, Dan would, I mean, Dan would just do stuff. This is what was interesting to me about uh, American brewing. After really having only the perspective of um, German brewing, and 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 then I guess some really traditional uh, brewers, at least from from Belgium and Pierre and Jean Luc. Yeah, uh, was that man? Dan would do stuff like make a bunch of elderflower wine, right? right. Um, and it was always great. I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing, and more than that, you know, he wanted the, me and 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 other people around him. Although I was really receptive to it, um, he wanted us to succeed. Right. I mean, he wanted us to know how to do what it was that he did. And he was great at explaining it. Right. Yep. Um, and my questions would be like, why, why? Why did you do this? Right. Well, I mean, why did you even begin to do this thing? Imperial Stout, for example, um, that is you know, difficult. It's going to be inaccessible for some people. And, um, you know, and, and we're, we're focused right on making beer that people are going to drink that we can make a lot of and sell a lot of. Right. Um, and, you know, that's not all that Dan was worried about. And it was really, really yeah. important for me to, to learn that. You know? Right. Well, and so I think that's a, that's a good segue uh, from, you know, your your European experience with Pierre and Jean-Luc. Right. Because those guys are running big breweries. Right. And so they want to sell large volumes of beer. Right. But American craft breweries, I mean, some of them are that way, right? There's obviously some really large breweries now as craft brewer Sierra in uh, New Belgium, Sam Adams, et cetera. I mean, once those guys put a, a new product out, it's got a certain amount of pull through it needs to achieve. Right. But for the rest of us, right, it's a different game. I mean, there's we have certain brands that we want to see that happen with. But there's other stuff that, you know, we have the freedom to do. Like I can do something on our pilot system at three and a half barrels. Right. And it can be as weird as I want to make it. Right. And there is a subset of our customer base that will just soak that stuff up. Right. They right. just, they love it. Right. The weirder it is, the better. Uh, and of course there's part of our customer base that won't like it, but, th but that's okay. Not every beer has to be for everybody. Right. Right. And right. that's the beauty of craft beer. And that's the beauty of what's going on in America. We've kind of gotten past that hang up, right? Most of the European brewers, and, and I think to this day, I mean, you're starting to see some craft stuff happen. But uh, even to this day, you know, they're stuck 
in these traditional styles because these are the styles that sell, right? Yeah, those are the styles that sell for Vorsteiner. That's great. Right. You can do other stuff if you want. Right, right. You only need 10 people to like it and you can sell it all out. Right, right. That's that's right. Uh, but it is, you know, it's an it's an American perspective. And I, and I think it can be expressed positively and very negatively um, uh, here in the States. And that's always been something that's that the friction between uh, doing it the traditional European way and doing it in the way that American brewers have done it for the last couple of decades um, has always been for me what's interesting about running a brewery and a brand in the United States. Um, yeah, Cause you do, you really, you do some of both. You do some of both. Yeah. yeah you weave them in as applicable. Right. right. Um, and I tend to be a much less experimental brewer uh, than, than you are. Um, and, and, and that has helped me sell a lot of beer. Um, but it's also, you know, something that means that we don't get as much free, you know, press and, uh, and adoration as some other breweries do, but it has well, a just because, just because you do it doesn't mean you're going to get the free press either. Right? Yeah, that's true. Well, that's my we, perspective. We get some, we don't, right. just, you know, people aren't fawning over us. If you want free press, you better set up shop on one of the coasts. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I know how, I know how to get free press. I'm about yeah. to do it in two weeks. I put some strawberry flavoring in my most popular yeah. beer and I sell 9,000 cases. Who cares? Right. Um, Exactly. Right. <laughs> I mean, the votes that I am worried about are the ones people make every day with their dollar bills. Yeah, 100 percent. That's, that's it. Right. I mean, great, you know, and free press and, and critical acclaim is great. But at the end of the day, if nobody's putting money in your till. Yeah. Right. Well, and I mean, you know, uh, for us, um, you know, we, we ended up hitting a big with New England IPA, which is fine. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, but and you, uh, and you provided me. That was a hard beer for me. Right. We were trying to make that style here and I couldn't figure out how to do it. And you helped me out quite a bit, which was great. Good. good. Um, but it was funny. I think I'm going to go back to Kurt Cobain for a second. Right. You ever seen that that uh, montage of heck thing that's out there? Yes. Yeah. So at one point, you know, they're going through his going through his diary and he makes his entry and he says, I have to unlearn how to play the guitar. He did right. a good job. Right. Right. And so making New England IPA, you have to unlearn how to make beer. Right? Kind of. Because Kinda. you do a lot of stuff that right. you're trained to not ever do. That's true. But for me, having it was, again, it was work having worked with uh, Jean-Luc and Pierre on the Silas Wit. Um, and reorganizing that beer for sale um, or for really for production in Michigan. Yeah. That informed everything yeah. about uh, New England IPA. I mean, every single thing. And one paper that Sapporo had written um, right. about yeah, how to, yeah, yeah, about how to prevent biotransformation, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, but, that, but that, that's what we're talking about this weaving of kind yeah. of traditional and non traditional and yeah. saying, you know, I mean, I think it's important after you reach a certain level in your in your career or a certain amount of time uh, doing this um, to say, you know, to open yourself up and not be so judgmental um, as I've been uh, and, and say, OK, well, New England IPA, right? Out of hand, I would like to dismiss this and not worry about it and keep doing what I'm doing, right? Yep. But at the same time, let's put let's put ourselves in a space where this is valid and it is real and there is a way that we can make this to the same standard etc as we make uh, other beer and that kind of exploration is fascinating no um, i agree I, I mean i had a lot of i had a lot of fun figuring that out right? yeah because it it challenged me yep like you're saying to give up some of these notions that you have about how you make beer so that's what i mean when I say you have to unlearn how to do it, right? Yeah. It's like there, there were certain rules that were immutable. You do not break these rules. This is how you make beer, right? right? And, it, and it always comes out well. It's like, okay, well, if I follow those rules, I can't get to this hazy nope. IPA, pale ale, whatever. So you have, to, you have to do what you just said and say, okay, let, let's, let's see what happens. We're going to break these, these immutable rules. Yeah and see where we get to, right? And so really, it challenged all that stuff. And it's like, okay, right? And, right. I, and I had to do that. I had to go through that because I was the same way. I'm not buying this. I think it's horseshit, right? right. Yep. And, and it turned out to be a really technical challenge, which was was great. Yep. Uh, 
you know? Well, and, and difficult to, you know, with, with regard to sales and, and inventory control, your distributors and your own inventory control, because ultimately yeah. people are certainly here because we talked about it a lot. We're, you know, learning or relearning um, how much better fresh beer is regardless. Now, if you're making a stable New England IPA that's centrifuged and taken care of all the way through the process, is it going to lose more than a West Coast IPA would when it was warm? That's really strongly aromatic. No, not really. Um, but we it's an expensive beer to make. It's a horribly inefficient beer if you do it right. Um, and so we charge a lot of money for that beer. And it seemed important then for me to communicate to people, look, you need to get this as, you know, within a couple months, right? Yep, yep. Um, and, and you want to buy it cold because I don't want to take all that money from you and have you, you know, it was selfish a little bit and have you pissed at me because it was old and warm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think it, it started an interesting conversation about, um, about freshness. And, and also, as I was saying, it, it's, it's almost like selling milk at a certain point, right? Cause you can't just fill your brewery up, empty it out, send it to your distributor and go, okay, you guys got four months worth of beer, man. Have fun. Right. Yeah. Um, or a month or whatever you, you have to control their inventory because a distributor will be happy to do anything they fucking want in order to make a dollar that day. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, that friction. Well, and that's what they're used to, right? I mean, that's right. the, the beers that they traditionally and predominantly handle can deal with that. Right. 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 So. Well, and this beer can, I mean, you know, M43 anymore can just the same way, uh, by the way, it's no two hearted, but, but the same way that, that two hearted, for example, can, um, I just don't want it to. Right. Um, and, and I want for people to be able to get this fresh. And I think that's a big part of why we've stayed, strong with that brand and it's been such a horse for us year in and year out now for this is the sixth year yeah. um that we've been making that beer so and it's you know it's it's profitable and there are a lot of a lot of great things about it but it presents its own challenges and i think when we and, and you know by, by the way i i did want to talk a little bit about uh dragon's milk as still oh, yeah. the national example of, I think, at least one of the national examples of an, a sort of an industrial produced barrel aged stout. That was, a, that was an interesting project, right? Yeah. So, uh, as a by the way, uh, New Holland was making that beer before I got there. Sure. Right? But when I got there, I wasn't real enamored with, with how it was presenting, right? So, for better or worse, uh, you know, the, the principals in that company, basically they said, do whatever you want, right? I mean, they, they gave me the keys to the brewery. I mean, Killer. I could change whatever I wanted, recipe, process, that I'm like, oh, okay, great. I will, I will do that then. Yeah, yeah. So we totally reformatted uh, not only that beer, but uh, the oatmeal stout. Uh, which at the time was known as the poet. I don't know if they still make that or not. I think they probably um, do. Um, but we totally reformatted that process and the, the barrel aging process and so on and so forth. Um, and that became a huge thing. And, and, you know, at first we were, we were doing it, you know, like we do it here at Warped Wing or like most breweries do, where it's sort of a, a one-off drop each year was an annual thing. And, so on and so forth. And, it, you know, it's an expensive beer to make, uh, but it also has a pretty fair margin on it, better than than the regular issue beers, right? Sure. And so we sort of came to terms with with that notion. Um, it's like, hey, we're making more beer, more money on this beer. If there was a way to increase the production on this beer, uh, you know, we'll make more money. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we really pushed it um, you know, to, to get the volume. Um, and it turned into this, this, you know, all the time core product for New Holland. In, in doing that, you know, there was a couple of hurdles that we had to cross, right? One of them was, you know, buying new wood all the time is expensive, right? And, and there was a point there where, you know, barrels were north of 200 a piece. Yeah. Uh, they've come down since then, but, you know, it's a lot of money. And at the time that I left, of course, we're burning 300 barrels, bourbon barrels every month. Right? 
So I'm getting a truckload. I mean, and unloading those, they don't load them in on skids, right? No. <laughs> you had to go, you know, manually, you know, we'd have like four or five guys in the truck and you're just covered in dirt and sweaty. And so, A, so it's a lot of barrels and uh, they're expensive. And so we're, we were starting to play around with, okay, can we use the wood more than once? And over time, we kind of came to this, this blended ratio, which was, you know, 30, 40% second use wood into the first use wood. And that was great because it was, it was a significant cost saver for us, but it created some other issues, right? Because you know, second use wood is not as microbiologically stable, right? No. <laughs> and so we went through a little period there where we were having some shelf stability issues uh, with the dragon's milk. And so, uh, we then had to develop a new process in order to make sure, because we didn't have the money to go buy a pasteurizer. Right. right? Uh, so I found, uh, I'm going now back to my Tom Clark mentorship. Uh, I started doing a search of all the scrap yards and I found, uh, a stainless steel, uh, 40, uh, 12 R 40, which means that 12, uh, candle filters, 40 centimeters long. And, uh, so we bought that, we bought all the candle filters, the sterile candle filters are by the way, about a thousand bucks for every, uh, 10 centimeters. So yeah. at the time, each one was like four grand and I got to buy 12 of them, uh, in the housing, which I got for next to nothing out of the scrap yard. And we got it cleaned up, and put it in and. So we ran this process by the time we left. I mean, it is, you know, there's a lot of sort of walking into this. It happened over a period of several months and maybe even a year. Uh, we started to take the, the sort of green beer, you know, we would ferment it in the tank. It would sit in the stainless for X amount of time. We didn't run it through the separator into a second bright tank. And then we would fill all the barrels, first use and second use, right? and label them in, in the whole deal. And then uh, they would age out for X amount of time. And then the presumption would just be that there would be a microbiological problem with those barrels. Because, you know, a batch, one batch would be a hundred bourbon barrels. I mean, I can't, Jesus. I can't go through and do a, a QC battery on each one of the barrels is impossible. When I left, I mean, we had three or 4,000 barrels sitting in this warehouse, right? So the expense and the time associated with it, so the presumption is just like, it's fucked up. Yep. And so we would then take all the beer out of the barrels. You know, you would have to taste them, right? I mean, you would see these guys when they were racking them at the end of the shift. I mean, they'd all be glassy eyed and stuff because they're using a wine thief just to make sure the, the barrel tastes okay. And it's just like an ounce at right. a time to make sure it, it tastes okay. But the presumption was that there would be something growing in it that would make it ultimately not taste okay. So you put it back in a tank and then we would, cause it's already been run through the separator. We would then run it through uh, a DE filter and then to a plate and frame filter that was nominally sterile and right. then to the cartridge filter that was actually sterile. And you had to run through this whole process in order to walk the beer down so that you wouldn't blind up your- Yeah, your sterile. $50,000 in cartridges, right? And then out to another bright tank to be carbonated and packaged and whatever. And that worked out really, I mean, it's a lot of work. We had, uh, there was a woman that worked for us at the time. Her name's Molly Browning. I think she works for Lalamon now. Uh, and that was Molly's job was to keep the barrels, to fill and empty barrels and to keep the barrel seller organized. And so I would go to Molly and I'd be like, hey, look, we need all the barrels from batch number X, Y, Z. And she would have to go into the barrel seller and find them, which was not easy. No, I, mean, I know that I could have done it because she had it organized. She knew where everything was. I right. walked in there. I'd be like, what, what the deuce is going These on? are all yeah. barrels. <laughs> yeah. And so she'd pull them all out and, you know, get them emptied. And, you know, we'd always give her someone to, to assist. Is there, there was always like a, a free pair of hands from the rest of the crew, but it was her job. She knew the process, she directed it. Uh, and then whoever we could give her to assist was there to, to, to do that, to help assist. Uh, and so it's great. She did a great job with that. And, uh, 
you know, we just, we cranked that stuff out, man. Yes, yes. you did. And yeah. they still do. I mean, we had a brewer uh, who worked here for a while. He was one of our favorite young guys who's come through here ever. His name is Josh Rake, uh, who's since opened a pub in Muskegon where he's from. But yes. um, he worked at New Holland uh, before he came here. And he also had the opportunity to work with Ron Jeffries. And Oh, yeah. I'll say it's great to see a kid who was interested in taking that path, right? He yeah. wanted to come work at Old Nation because he, he wanted, wanted to learn. He wanted to learn from you. Well, Nate and myself, yeah. Yep. yep. Um, and, uh, you know, and he got the opportunity to, and he's just, he's just one of these great guys who I told him, uh, in fact, I had him on a podcast. He was one of the first ones we did just to kind of yep. see if I could do it. And um, I told him the same thing that you told me once, and I don't know if you'll remember this. Um, but, uh, you know, he was, he'd opened right before the pandemic and he was struggling. He was trying to make it work. And he had, you know, a lot of, um, agita around all this. And, um, he had, you know, he was sharing that with me and, and, uh, and what I told him was again, what, what you had told me was, listen, man, if anybody can do this, I, I think you can. Right. Um, and I'm here to help you if you need it. Right. I mean, if it's a lawyer or if it's equipment or, you know, whatever. I mean, if it's legal to do, I'll do it for you. And if it's not, then maybe we'll figure it out anyway. Um, and I, I haven't had the opportunity to do that in in, in years. And it, it felt good to me. I know I know it, it, it bolstered his confidence. Um, and uh, I didn't realize really how much I had missed that kind of a relationship until I had the opportunity to have it again, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, you know, that's uh, as they've gotten older, um, you cherish that stuff more, right? Yes. And you realize that really, you know, my job is the brewmaster isn't really to make beer. No. Nope. Right. My job as brewmaster is to make brewers. Right. hundred percent. And then they make the beer. Uh, 100%. And so it's a real point of pride for me. Uh, when I look around uh, the various places that I have been and I see guys that I have helped train and brought into the industry and now they either own their own brewery or they're running their own brewery uh i take a lot of pride in that you know like john stewart who was at perrin for a long time jacob derillo at brewery vivant um you know i got a guy here jeff fortney that's uh, running a brewery called eudora uh you know it's it's just there's tons of them right, right. Tons of these guys, and I'm sure you know. If any of them, I'm sorry if I didn't mention your name, um, but I, I love them all. Yeah, right? yeah, uh, the huge like children. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to part two of Trust in the Process with John Haggerty and Travis Fritz. You know, you're responsible for the livelihood of, of um, you know a handful of people. Um, it's scary uh, to get different perspectives on work, on philosophy toward work and on the brewing industry specifically. My passion yeah. is to make something that is as perfect as I can make it, no matter what it is. Right. Man, you're super mediocre. Stop being mediocre. You're built to be not mediocre. <laughs> I, so I got back to St. Louis and we sit in the meeting. I said, okay guys, what are we gonna do with the IPA? And they're like, yeah, we're probably not gonna do anything with it. They weren't drinking beer to get out of their family and to get out of their life and get out it of their just head. Part they, of it. it was part of it. Um, and I think that's what, you know, that is a huge inf information uh, to me on, on drinking. So your first job as a brewer is to not give anyone a hangover they didn't have.